Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Real Money, Real Business podcast. I'm Lauren, and today we have David on the show who's selling a display advertising, Amazon Associates, and affiliate business on the Empire Flippers Marketplace. Hey, David, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing spectacular. Thank you very much for having me on. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear you're doing so well, and I'm really excited to have you on the show. But before we dive in, I'm going to give the listeners a brief overview of the business so they know exactly what we're talking about. This is a three-site display advertising, Amazon Associates, and affiliate business. It was created in February 2012, and it's in the culinary, food and beverages, and equipment niches. The average revenue for the business is $11,413 per month, and it makes an average of $11,333 per month in net profit. The assets included with the business are domains, including all content and files for the sites, Facebook and Twitter social media accounts, an email list with 9,000 subscribers, and several additional sites in the same niche. For everyone listening, you can visit empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing number 64903 to learn more about this business. Or you can unlock this listing to start your due diligence if you're interested in purchasing the asset. Now that the listeners know what we're talking about, let's hear from you, David. Can you fill us in on your background in starting and running online businesses? Yeah, sure. Would love to. I've been in this world for about a little over 10 years now. I got started back when I was in the corporate world, when I realized that you know, corporate life, that wasn't the life for me. And I had to find something else to do. I started listening to Pat Flynn and Tim Ferriss, and you know, they blew my mind. Once they opened up the world of what was truly possible with online businesses, you know, I was off to the races. I was building sites, trying all different types of monetizations, all types of different niches. Leaned into Amazon Associates real hard for a while, dabbled in Amazon FBA for a while. But once I found out how lucrative it could be and fun and to write articles for the display ad business model. I was off to the races and I've been having a blast ever since. Yeah, it's amazing the freedom and flexibility that online businesses can give you compared to the traditional nine to five job. Yeah. And thanks to these sites and a couple others in the portfolio, I was able to walk away from the corporate world about three years ago. Yeah. It's been a life changer. That's always great to hear. You mentioned that you tried a bunch of different monetization methods, but display advertising is what you really stuck with. What is it about display advertising that really resonates with you? And why do you think you found success with that? I love the content. When I was more focused on Amazon affiliate ads, I was writing those typical best of and buying guides and all that sort of stuff. And I could write it and it would sell, but you know, it wasn't fun. It wasn't articles out to show my kids or anything like that. You know, being able to write content that's fun, useful, informative. I'm not trying to get anybody to buy stuff. I just want their eyeballs on some display ads. I guess the reason I'm so successful with it is I really enjoy the work. I hope that answers the question for you. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, if you're going to wake up every morning and have to write content, it should be something that you're passionate about. Speaking of things that you're passionate about, what made you choose to create uh, websites in this particular niche? It's a niche that I've always enjoyed. As long as I'm doing it, I might as well take a picture and write an article. It was also the first niche where I was able to make some serious money. Like I said earlier, I've tried a lot of different niches, and this is the first one where everything really started to fall in place. Everything really started to click. So early success in the niche, and it's a niche I enjoyed, and it was natural to progress in it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you certainly seem to have experienced a lot of success, which is fantastic. So the majority of your revenue does come from display ads, as we've said, but you do have a couple of other revenue streams. Do you want to walk our listeners through those as well? Yeah, sure. I do some Amazon affiliate work, not a lot. I sort of detuned my sites away from Amazon, but there's still residual Amazon associate income coming in. There are also several affiliates on share sale for products that I truly love. And between the residual Amazon affiliate and the share sale, there's the extra revenue streams coming in there. Fantastic. And when it comes to your display advertising, are you affiliated with multiple networks and partners or just one provider? Everything is on Ed Thrive. I'm trying to keep my life as simple as possible. 
always a good strategy. So you've got a lot of passion for this business. I can certainly hear that in the questions you've answered so far. So what are the reasons you've decided to sell the business now? There's multiple reasons. The primary, most obvious reason is it's always been a goal that once the portfolio reached certain financial targets, that I wanted to sell it. And I reached those targets this year. On personal note, I'm in my 50s. Our kids are out of the house and it's time to start doing some retirement planning. And this is a part of that package. On a different level, I have been doing this niche a long time. I've got multiple sites going and it's starting to feel a little bit like work. And I don't want to work. I want to have fun. And I've got other projects, other niches. You know, currently, I like working on more. You know, These sites aren't getting my full attention and it's time for them to go somewhere else and to keep different levels going here. I made a serious life change this year. I've dropped 40 pounds, doing much healthier and running multiple food blogs doesn't really align with how I'm living my life right now. So between all those reasons, I'm perfectly happy to pass this opportunity along to somebody new. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, it sounds like playing around with websites allows you to break free of that corporate life. And now being able to sell this site will help you advance your life in new ways, which is very inspirational. Looking back on your journey with this site, are there any major successes or wins that really stand out? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever watch some of those reality TV shows where the someone finds an, an antique classic car in a barn that's been abandoned for 40 years and they go and fix it up and it's the before and the after and what a find. Yeah, absolutely. One of the sites in this portfolio is one of those abandoned cars. One of these sites got started as a passion project from someone who was truly a world-class expert in the niche, but they didn't understand SEO. They didn't understand monetization and they didn't understand the technical aspects of things like updating themes and plugins, all that sort of stuff. After they built the site for about seven years, they walked away from it. And I was able to reach out to them, buy the site from them and spend a year just doing the rehabilitation on it, SEOing all the posts, fixing all the plugins, adding some new content. You know, the site just absolutely took off. I'm really proud of being able to find such a beautiful site like that and bring it back to life. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one. That was the biggest win, absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that analogy of comparing it to restoring an old car because that's exactly what it can be like, you know, just fiddling at the engine and waiting to see what works and what doesn't. I think that's a really great story there. I'm sure not everything was as exciting or went as well. Were there any big setbacks or challenges that you faced? Absolutely. I spent some time thinking about this question and the biggest setback, it was also another site that's in this portfolio. And although the setback hurt, it was truly transformative and helped launch me forward. One of these sites, I leaned heavily into Amazon Associates and was making real good money. And the more money I made, the more I leaned into Amazon Associates. You know, before I knew it, I had a site that was filled up with pretty thin affiliate content that wasn't valuable. Google came along and adjusted my traffic, shall we say. It was painful when it happened, but it was also the push that I needed to find different types of monetization. That's what got me into this, the display ad model. It also really forced me to learn the lesson of diversification, which is why I'm working in a portfolio now. So if anything does happen to a site, I've got others to fall back on. That was a setback. But again, just the recovery of that site was, I had a blast doing that. I deleted about 40% of the content on that site over the course of a week. I got rid of 95% of all the Amazon affiliate links, content, everything on that site. And it was so much fun to get rid of it. I was smiling as I was deleting. It's like, I don't like this article. You're gone. You're gone. You're gone. 95% of the affiliate content out of there. I started publishing the type of content that I truly liked. You know, the site took back off. Google loves it again. But the setback of leaning too hard into Amazon Associates, lesson learned. Yeah, certainly. As you say, it must have been a tough lesson to learn, but it allowed you to write the content that you enjoy and helped you learn how to set yourself up for bigger success and protect yourself from those Google algorithm updates. So Absolutely. yeah, light at the end of the tunnel there. Speaking of Google algorithm updates and traffic, where does the majority of your traffic currently come from? Organic Google search. It's about 90% Google and you know, it's a little bit of Bing, Yahoo, all that sort of stuff. Okay, great. And do you invest much time into on-page SEO or backlink campaigns to help drive that traffic? Most of my backlinks are either naturally occurring or a result of outreach to other food bloggers. And that's one of the nice things about having the three-site portfolio. It makes it very easy to negotiate links with other bloggers. There's a lot of different topics covered and it opens the door to doing three-way swaps. So it's not it's a nice leveraged asset to be able to backlink with other bloggers. Yeah, absolutely. You do have Facebook and Twitter accounts as well. Do you do any social media marketing? 
No, I don't. And honestly, for, you know, for later on, I think that's one of the growth opportunities is you know, this is a very visual niche, a uh, very social type niche. I'm a hardcore introvert and I don't like Facebook. I don't like Twitter. I've got the accounts, but I don't use them. Yeah, I hear you with that. It's difficult to break into that and sort of put yourself out there with social media content. You also have quite a big email list. How often do you send emails to your subscribers, if at all? Weekly. Sometimes I'll do two or three a week. Sometimes I'll skip a week, but on average, it's weekly. Okay, fantastic. Following on from that social media question, as you said, what are the major growth opportunities that you've identified for this business? There are a lot of levers left to pull here. If I'm going to keep running it, the growth is going to be more informational content for display ad revenue. There is absolutely no shortage of keywords. The shortage is on my time to get them written. There's plenty of room left just on informational content. A very logical, easy place to grow this is a shift towards more affiliate content. You know, for the level of traffic these sites get, the affiliate revenue is you know, comically low. One of the sites, the Restored Car site, there's not a single Amazon link anywhere on it. I think there's actually only one affiliate link on the entire site. There's an easy shift towards affiliate marketing available. There are a ton of products to promote, and a lot of the products are really expensive. That possibility is wide open. Between the organic traffic, the niche, and um, the email list, if someone was so inclined, the FBA angle is very real. And you can build yourself a nice little FBA brand if you want to branch out into that type of business. Or if you already have an existing FBA brand, you can leverage this to supplement that very easily. The email list is not monetized. I use it to hang out with my buddies, with my friends in the niche, to share stuff that I find interesting. I just I like writing. And so I email these guys, but I don't sell to these guys. The email list is on ConvertKit, and ConvertKit just launched their sponsor network, which has me really intrigued. For folks unfamiliar with the sponsor network on ConvertKit, once your list gets up to 10,000 subscribers, they work with you to put display ads from premium advertisers directly into your email list. We're currently at 9,000 subs. I'm going to hit 10,000 subs easily by Christmas, and as soon as I get that 10,000 subs, ConvertKit will help monetize the email list just through display ads. You know, so that's going to be an automatic, easy growth that's going to happen for either me or the new owner or, or whoever. I've got plans to sell physical products to my email list. Recently bought a CNC machine so I can do some custom physical products. Let's just leave it at that, that I could sell to this list quite easily. I've also got a, a collection of eBooks, PDFs that I put together. They're fun to write. I think they're great, but I have the sales funnel in place. I hate selling, and it's really held me back from that aspect of monetization. Yeah, there's lots of potential in, in the email list. Other growth ideas, this might sound a little odd, but you can easily create a new site. And the reason I bring this up is this is a three-site package in the niche, and it essentially provides you a roadmap of how to succeed in the niche. It shows the type of articles that work. It shows the keywords. It shows everything that a successful site has. You know, there's a lot of real estate on page one of Google. And I like the idea of taking as many of those spots as possible, you know, leveraging the existing portfolio to make it a little bit bigger. And last up is social. Like I said earlier, I don't use Facebook, but I am in a blogging group with a couple of folks who are absolutely crushing it with Facebook. I mean, they've really opened up my eyes. With an effective Facebook strategy, you can drive some serious traffic to this. So anyhow, there's lots of growth levers left to pull. No shortage of opportunity. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. And it sounds like a lot of these opportunities wouldn't be too hard for buyers to achieve or to latch onto, which is fantastic. You can tell, again, that you have such a passion for what you write. Can you walk us through your content creation process and how you come up with the topics and your keyword research? Keyword research is mainly looking at weaker sites in the niche, finding out what they're ranking for and crushing them. There's a lot of weak sites that are getting traffic and it's I eat their lunch, literally. <laughs> I've also spent time looking at some of the larger sites in the niche and finding keywords that ranking for accidentally. Sometimes they'll have keywords in an H2 heading in an article and they start ranking for that. And that's easy keywords to go after as well. And a lot of times it's content that I want created. So that's the general keyword research process is you know, seeing what's out there, seeing what works. I guess another key part of the keyword research process for me is Google Search Console. And again, it's a three-site portfolio. I've got each site focused a little bit different. And when I see that site A is ranking for a slate of keywords, it's real simple just to come over to site B and write equivalent type content. And the sites feed off each other. They got each other as to what works and what doesn't work. It's sort of an unfair advantage that the site has over the competition. 
Yeah, I like that. I think it's great. That's the benefit of having a portfolio. As you say, they can feed off of each other and benefit from one site's advantage across all three of them. What do you think it is about your content that really stands out and, as you say, crushes these weaker sites? I've got the time to do it. Like I said, I've been out of corporate for three years. I've got the time just to sit down and write a really great article and take great pictures. You know, I've been in the game for 10 years, and I think I've got a better understanding of SEO than a whole lot of my smaller competitors. I've got the time. I've got the expertise. Yeah, perfect. Makes a lot of sense. What does a typical work week look like for you when running the business? How long does it take you to write the articles? How much time are you maintaining the site every week? Maintaining the site, I've outsourced that to folks doing backups, plug-in updates, all that sort of stuff. So site maintenance, it costs me about 25 bucks a month. I don't worry about it. Content creation, I tend to do in batches. I do content sprints. So some months I'm working my butt off on the sites. Other months I'm not creating any content at all. The content creation part gets efficient, again, because of the portfolio. If I was in the taco niche, I can create a taco recipe and take a ton of different pictures and title it three different ways, coming at it from three different angles. So for the same basic keyword research and same time it takes me to create the recipes, I can create three different articles, three different recipes for the different sites. It can be a very efficient process if you... Once you figure out how to leverage the keywords, a typical article will take me maybe four hours to write. Yeah, fantastic. As you say, it's great that you're able to streamline that process by writing for all three sites because they are in the same niche, which is fantastic. Given everything that we've discussed, what do you think the biggest challenge will be for a buyer taking over this business? I think there's two risks for a new buyer. The first is uh, content creation. There are a lot of keywords that can be outsourced to competent writers and yeah, you can do it. It's not what I do, but it can be done. There's another level of content that does require a certain level of expertise, either developing that expertise yourself, finding a writer that has that expertise. That would be a step that have to be accomplished. I've thought about that issue some, and what I realized is you know, there's 9,000 email subs that do love this niche, and I have no doubt whatsoever, but there would be some people that would love to help out with content out of that email list. That's the first real risk is content creation, being able to get the expertise to write the type of article that's going to rank. The second risk that I would be concerned about with the new owner is if they lean too hard into Amazon Associates, it's really sexy. It's really seductive. And I would hate for someone to fall into that trap of, right, you know, we're going to do all these buying guides, all these best subs. And it's such easy money to go after. I'm afraid someone would do it and end up triggering Google again. Finding the right balance of growth, let's say, that's something I'd be concerned about for a new owner is just getting a little bit too greedy. Yeah, sure. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, especially being a trap that you yourself fell into. And obviously, you know how to overcome that challenge having done it yourself. So how much support are you willing to offer buyers to help them avoid these same pitfalls that you fell prey to? I believe I put down three months of support, but I love these sites. I want these sites to succeed. I'm going to support them. I'm more than willing to do keyword research, help the new owners get expertise, understands the ins and out of the niche. Whoever owns these, it's going to be set up for success. Yeah, fantastic. I think your willingness to support the buyer will go a long way and help buyers feel like they have a leg to stand on when taking over such an unfamiliar business. When it comes time to negotiating the sale, are you open to negotiating something like an earnout agreement? I am open to it, yes. Wonderful. And would you commit to a non-compete agreement? Yes, I would. Fantastic. Well, David, you've been in this industry for 10 years, as we've discussed, and I'm sure you've learned a lot along the way. Is there any advice that you give to aspiring listeners who are thinking of starting websites of their own? Any advice that you wish you knew when you first started out in the website industry? Biggest advice is pivot faster and listen to what works. I spend a lot of time trying to go down path ABC and Every now and then I get little glimmers of things that work and I should have pivoted harder, faster into what was working. You know, just being open to reinventing, starting over, being willing to learn. I think that's the best advice I could give. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's fantastic advice. I think a lot of website owners can get a bit stagnant and stuck in a rut with what they're doing, um, but it's definitely a business model that allows for that flexibility and the ability to pivot. So I think you're 100% correct there. And that leads us to the final question of the interview and probably the most important one. So, David, if you had to put yourself into the shoes of a buyer, why do you think your business is a business worth buying? This business is worth buying 
because it is a low maintenance cash generating machine that has an unfair advantage over the competition. Risk is minimized through diversification and there's a clear path to continued growth. If I was looking to buy a business, this ticks every one of my boxes. Fantastic. Very well said. Uh, Nice, short and simple and sweet. I like it. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners that I might have missed before we wrap up? No, I think you did a good job of covering everything. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, David, thank you so much for coming onto the show and giving us some more insight into not only you and your business, but websites in general. I certainly learned a lot. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this listing has already been sold, head over to empireflippers.com forward slash marketplace and search for listing number 64903. If you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. Once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So until next time, enjoy your digital journey.